So we're continuing on in our series in the book of James this morning, and um, for those of you who haven't been part of the series, we're talking, we're working through the book of James, I'm preaching through it, and uh, J- James is a very important book. Um, it shares with us a lot of practical wisdom. And so we're continuing from where we left off last week. We left off last week um, on verse 13 of James chapter 2. And last week's message was about how the royal law of love um, is such an important law um, and how God has called his people to treat other people the way that um, God has treated us with mercy and with care and going out of our way to ensure that people that are feeling broken and downhearted, discouraged, or otherwise uh, not doing well, that we keep an eye out for them and we, and we ensure that we don't leave them alone, that we, we love and care for one another. Well, there's a lot um, in James chapter 2 that talks about practical living. And um, to this morning, we're going to continue um, in James chapter 2, and our text this morning is from verses uh, 14 to 26. And this morning, we're going to be talking about how, um, about saving faith, and the difference between saving faith and faith that is not saving, and also about Christ-centered stewardship, stewardship in uh, conjunction with that. So, Let's bow our hearts before God in prayer before we start into the Word. God, we thank you for your Word. Your Word brings life to your people. Lord, James has many things to say to us this morning, and some of the teaching is is hard. But Lord, you understand what we need before we even pray. So this morning I just pray for everybody that's here and those that are listening online, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd show us the truth of your word and how that you want us to apply it. And help me, Lord, to articulate it in a way that is honoring to you. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So James um, continues on this theme of the royal law of love and how we treat other people. And um, he continues on this theme by saying in verse 14, What good is it my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such a faith save them? It's an important question. James transitions his uh, thoughts to the aspect of what faith is. He wants to make a point with believers by asking them a rhetorical question. Apparently, some in the church in that day, as there are people in this day, were teaching that since people had been saved by grace through their faith in Jesus, that they now had the, pers- the, the freedom to pursue a better and happier life exclusively for themselves and their own families. That doesn't sound terrible, does it? Hmm. Well, if you think about this, there's a little bit of a problem with that kind of thinking. You see, Christ can be our personal Savior and the matter of our salvation settled. But is our faith walk with God all about personal gratification? Is that what it's all about? Self-fulfillment? I'm sorry to say this, but this is a very big issue in the North American church. It really is. And um, it's the very kind of thinking that has actually destroyed many churches in North America, placing them on spiritual life support. Let me explain. In the words of this uh, psychologist, Anna Lemke, her name is, she has this book called The Dopamine Nation, uh, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. 
And um, she says something that kind of resonated with me when I was preparing for this message. She says this. She says, the reason why so many of us are so miserable is because maybe we're working so hard to avoid being miserable. The reason we're so miserable, maybe because we're working so hard to avoid being miserable. Well, let's face it. Like when we look at our society out there, right? Um, what confronts us? Hedonism. The lovers, the loving of pleasure above all else. Much of our aim in our society as a whole, in living out the American dream, is to try and indulge stimulating or luxurious activities which pamper the inner you and bring us increasingly more personal fulfillment. And sadly, this mentality has been, become prevalent, or prevalent, I should say, in many Christian communities. Jesus Christ is pursued on many fronts and relegated to the position of personal Savior only. What do I mean by that? Well, this is where people essentially look to take care of themselves and their own families, but there is little or no investment in community, in serving other people outside of their inner circle, or giving time, or financial resources, or whatever, or talents, or abilities to further God's kingdom work. It's all about me and mine. Friends, what we do with our life investment is important to God. Very, very important. Coming into the kingdom of God as a true believer in Jesus Christ, we surrender the rights of living our lives the way that we want to live them, and instead, we ask God to show us how He wants us to live them. And then if we truly love God, and we love other people around us the way that God intends that we do, it's going to translate practically into where and how we invest our energies and our resources. Our life is not our own. As a Christian, we are purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. We now belong to Him. Our lives, our aspirations, our careers, our hobbies, our families belong to the Lord. So, it's not that the good deeds that God wants to see in our lives are what saves us, okay? Salvation is given to us by grace alone from God through faith. And this isn't the result of works, not so that we can brag and say, I earned my way, I'm good enough that I can be saved. It's not about that. But God calls His children to whole life stewardship in recognition that our lives have been given to us on loan by God to glorify Him. So, can one have truly saving faith in the Lord without displaying any kind of good deeds? Jesus said this. He said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Many folks believe that the principle of faith is a way to get God on their side so that they can live better, more comfortable, and prosperous lives for themselves. And faith is viewed as a matter that should keep us in a personal-sized bubble. But James calls that thinking into question here. In essence, what he says maybe, what he asks as a question may be phrased another way. Can a self-focused faith save a man? He continues 
an illustration reading from verse 15 of our text this morning. Suppose that a brother or sister was without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? The illustration James uses here, it wasn't meant to restrict the exercise of good deeds to seeing people that are in poverty inside of the church getting their needs met. It's not meant as a restricting thing. It's used as a good example, a great example, to get us to think about the essence and genuineness of our faith. Essentially what he's saying is that when, when true believers see a practical need in front of them, it's, isn't it not reasonable for those believers to, uh, to go and meet that need? Or is it, I can't be bothered. I've got my own things to deal with. Um, I turn a blind eye because someone else can meet that need. Hmm. Okay. So the default response for the believer that truly has a connection with saving faith in Christ is that the love of God will enter your spirit and will change the way that you view the world. No longer do you view the world as just something that you, per, that you approach for yourself. You view the world as to how you can love God by loving other people and by, and by looking beyond your own parameters. Okay, so the whole thought of ignoring the need that's present around us for the true believer, actually, James is saying here, it's incomprehensible. James continues in verse 17 saying, in the same way, faith by itself, is not, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have deeds. Hmm. Well, inevitably, when we have this discussion, okay, someone's going to suggest that you don't need faith in God to be a catalyst to do good in society today. And it's true, right? It's true. Many people do good things without having a saving faith in Jesus. There are many service clubs in our communities, um, in our community here. There's many service clubs. There's people that go out and do benevolent work all over the place. To these people... You don't need God to do good things that benefit the world. But if you look at this on a deeper level, the question that needs to be answered is this. Where does one's idea of morality come from? Where does it come from? Is what is good or evil, right or wrong, simply an abstract idea that's generated from social conditioning in a society? If so, what or who determines the standard that social conditioning um, works out? For that matter, what can be defined as good? In our world today, in our society today, everything seems to be relative. Relative to what you believe. What are relative to what you believe? Truth is some fluctuating thing. But in reality... There needs to be a definition for what is good, what is evil. Richard Taylor, an eminent ethicist, writes, educated people do not need to be told the question, that questions such as these have never been answered outside of religion. That's what he says. He concludes contemporary writers in ethics who blithely discourse about moral right and wrong and moral obligation without any reference to religion are really just weaving intellectual webs out of thin air, which amounts to saying that they discourse without meaning because there's no standard by which they're drawing from because everything is relative. So in the end, if you have deeds without faith, 
A person denies the very existence of the God who is actually the author of the very moral principles that are being followed. And if you throw God out of the picture, it's a cauldron that could have any result. And we've seen that over the centuries, haven't we? Where people throw God out and they make their own rules and they call evil good and they call good evil and everything is just a mishmash of of suffering. It ends up as a mishmash of suffering. So, in the end, if you have deeds without faith, person denies the existence of God, you're denying the very foundation by which ethics are actually enacted. The creator of ethic is God. It doesn't come out of nebulous nothingness. Okay. So, following that line of thinking, when you really get to the bottom of it, makes about as much sense as the opposing spectrum, right? And that is that works, or sorry, faith, the opposing spectrum is that faith without works is something that you can, you can um, pursue. You can, you can pursue faith without works. But faith without works leads to deadness as much as works without faith. There's a dead end there. Now, I know this is a tough passage of Scripture for us, and honestly, I don't like going bang, bang, bang on your heads, like as your pastor. I don't believe that that is what God wants for me. Okay? I, want God, I, I believe that God wants me to challenge you, to challenge you to think about where your heart is. Now, with that funeral that we had yesterday, I just want to say something here. Okay. Not everybody is struggling with this disconnect between faith and works. What I saw yesterday was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Here is this family mourning the loss of their, their loved one, a dear sister of ours that's passed on, someone that God took out of the, ab, the complete darkness of, 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 of depravity and set free. And, and then placed his love inside of her heart, and she became one of our family. I saw people here yesterday pouring themselves out for that family that came in here that was grieving their loss, not knowing which end is up. I saw that. Thank you for serving the Lord in that way. It's, it's just a testimony that, that, that God is at work in his people because not only was that food that you guys made there, but it was done with excellence. I can't express this. Okay, Joyce's husband is not a believer. And when he saw what was done here, in honor of their family and his dearly beloved that's passed on, his heart was stirred. His heart was spoken to. That's what the church is called to do in this society. We're supposed to be light in the darkness. We're supposed to go out of our way and, and, and meet needs where people are in need. And that's not just with funerals. It's with everything. Everything that we do inside the church, outside the church, with our families, with the families that live next door to us in our neighborhood. All of these things are so important to God. And He wants us to live our faith, and put our faith into action. Show me your deeds, James says in verse 18. Without, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Sadly, there's many people who claim to be Christians that do not actually have a heart connection with God with saving faith because there's been no evidence of any change for such people who are religious in word only James had this to say he says this very plainly he says you believe that there is one God good even the demons believe that and shudder you foolish person do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? 
In every well-proportioned life, there must be faith and works moving hand in hand together. Saving faith results in the practical demonstration of God's saving power through the changed life on the outside. Mere belief that Jesus Christ is who He says He is without repentance from sin and the demonstration of faith accompanied by action with deeds is not truly saving faith. It is what I would say in this Scripture passage is demonic faith. Yes, demons have faith. Demonic faith is an acknowledgement of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is not accompanied by the love of God, love for God, love for His creation, or respect for what God has said we should do or we should not do. God's commands. As such, it's knowledge-based faith alone that does not follow the way of intimacy in relationships with God or in holy living or righteous living. There's no repentance from living in darkness with demonic faith. True saving faith, on the other hand, produces a transformed life accompanied by holy living. Saving faith finds tangible reality in both the things that we avoid because they're wrong and also the things that we pursue because they are the right thing to do. So to further illustrate this point about the nature of saving faith, James brings two familiar stories to us from the Bible. If you've been in Sunday school, even if you're newly coming to church, but if you've learned some of the Bible, in the past, okay, you might be familiar with these two stories that I'm going to talk about. The first illustration was from the father of the Jewish nation. The second was from a pagan Gentile prostitute who had come from a dishonorable background, yet placed her trust in God and was saved. So, James continues in verse 21, and he says this. He says, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled in saying that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not just by faith alone. Now as he is is James, Martin Luther had a problem with this verse right here. Okay. He did. He had a problem with James because he thought justification is by faith alone or by, uh, by grace alone through faith alone. And this seems to contradict it. No, actually, what, there's no contradiction here. Okay. True saving faith is by grace alone through faith alone, but that faith is accompanied by an openness to the love of God and saying, God, take me. Take me. I renounce shameful and secret ways. I renounce my sin, Lord. I turn away from it and I ask God that you clean me, that you take me in your direction. And then when that happens, the Holy Spirit moves in and gives us the power that we need to be overcomers. So, in fact, it is a work of grace to have true saving faith. Because this is not of yourselves. You can't work this up. If you're having a struggle with your faith, you need to go to God in prayer. He's the only one that can take your heart and rend it so that your faith is genuine. You can't work it up. So, in the background of the story of Abraham here, in Genesis chapter 15, God comes to Abraham and tells him that he's been chosen and uh, that he would be Abraham's shield and his very great reward. That's what he says to Abraham. At that time, he was called Abram. Abraham is baffled by this because, you see, at the time when that promise was made to him, um, he and his wife Sarah were childless. So he's like, how in the world is that going to happen, God? Essentially is what he says in that text. 
There's this man named Eliezer of Damascus that was in line to inherit, it, inherit everything that Abraham possessed when he passed away. So God says, I'm going to be your shield and your very great reward. Well, where's the reward, God? I don't see it. But God assures Abraham that this would happen and makes him a promise. His promise is made, and he says this in Genesis 15, 4 to 6. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man, talking of Eliezer of Damascus, will not be your heir, but a son of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So when we see that Abraham originally places his trust in God by believing God's word to him. This is the essential root of Abraham's faith. Abraham was justified before God by believing, and his faith was recognized by God as being legitimate. Well, fast forward 30 years later, roughly, the scholars tell us. It's not until Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham's faith that was evident here was really, really tried and put to the test. See, in between the promise and 30 years later, with what I'm going to explain to you, God miraculously gave Abraham and Sarah a baby when Abraham was 100 years old and his wife was beyond childbearing years. She was, she was no longer able to have children, but yet there is this miraculous birth of a child to Abraham when he's 100. God's, God's fulfilling a promise to Abraham in a miracle. And then what does God do? Well, sometime after Isaac, the promised one, the promised child, was born, God tells Abraham, I want you to take your child, the one that I gave you. I want you to go up on Mount Moriah and I want you to sacrifice him on an altar. And Abraham's like, can you imagine that? It's like, what? What, what is this? Like, what is God talking about with this? Like, why would he ask me something like that? Those questions would be running through everyone's mind, right? But Abraham, you know what he did? He's like, okay, God, this, I don't understand your way. I don't understand what you're trying to accomplish in this, but I know that you've been faithful and that you've made me a promise, and that promise will be fulfilled. So I will listen to you, I will obey you, and I will go and I will give everything to you that I am and everything that I have. It's all yours. Therefore, let's go. He tells Isaac to go. Isaac's like, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And he's like, the Lord himself will provide a sacrifice, son. See, Abraham understood God as a just God. And he knew something was going to happen in between that time and when he laid his son on the altar. He knew that God was going to do something. Why? Because God is, God is just. And God keeps his promises. He's a promise keeper. So him and Isaac, they go up the hill to Mount Moriah and uh, they gather the wood and they put the wood on the altar. And then Abraham takes Isaac, puts him on the altar, says, okay, here we go. Isaac's probably like, what in the world is going on, Dad? Abraham binds him up. And he's ready to, okay, God, what next? He's ready to slay him. And God says, no, don't do it. Why? Because it's not in his character to, to do something like that, right? God says, don't do it. He says, now I know that you will not hold, withhold even the most precious thing to you from me. Now I know that your heart is totally mine, that you truly believe me. He says, look over there, and there's a ram tangled in the thicket. He says, take that ram and sacrifice the lamb instead of the boy. And it's a picture, a beautiful picture of salvation, isn't it? How God himself, the lamb of God, comes and takes our place on the altar where we deserve death. God lets himself be, be sacrificed on an altar. To cleanse us from our sins. Beautiful. Okay, so Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
So Abraham's faith was accompanied by a willingness to be obedient to God. Even with the most difficult thing that God would ever ask anybody to do. I've heard many people say, you can ask me a lot of things to do, but to give my children, well, that would, I couldn't do that. I mean, you can't. But you know something? God, if you trust God, you know that he's got good things in mind for you and your kids. You can trust God with your kids. You can trust that he's going to do the right things with you, your family, your kids, with your church. He's going to do the right things. He's righteous. There's no darkness in him, no shadow of turning with him. So here we have Abraham with his faith accompanied by a willingness to do whatever God desires him to do. If you love your life more than Christ, you're not worthy of him. You don't have to worry, though. When you give your life to Christ, he's not some saddest. saddest. He's not up there going, ha ha, now I'm going to get you. That's not your God. God loves you. He loves your family. He loves your church. He is with you. He's for you. He's not against you. You can trust his word. You can trust every promise in it. And he will never fail. Heaven and earth will pass away, my friends, but God's word will never pass away because he is true and he is faithful to the very end of the age. He is always the same. You can trust him. So in the same way, James says, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? James, so James even goes deeper with this thought of faith and works, right? Using Abraham as an example of faith is one thing, but a Gentile prostitute as an example of faith? That's a whole different ballgame. Rahab, unlike the patriarch Abraham, was not a devout follower of God until she came into contact with God's people. In that case, the spies that went into the land of Canaan. I don't know what they said to her, but they said something to her that opened her heart up to God. There are very few occupations that people pursue that are as vile and dishonorable as someone who decides to sell their body for sex with strangers. We all agree with this, right? I mean, that's, this is not... This is really disturbing. It's not good. Yet the Bible tells us of a story of a lady named Rahab who despite her dishonorable occupation, when confronted by God, chose to believe. She was certainly not saved by the goodness of her character, was she? Rahab was a Canaanite. She lived in the city of Jericho. She had heard rumors about the armies of Israel and how they, they had gone and defeated every army that stood in their path. She'd heard these stories. The people in Jericho were very concerned because the Israelite, Israelites had crossed over the River Jordan. They were concerned. So there was a lot of talk going on in the city about what was next. She concluded when she had all these thoughts And we don't know how all those thoughts transpired and worked themselves out. But she concluded that the Hebrew God was the one true God and that the spies of Israel came, coming to scout out the city, were, were on God's side. And the God of the Hebrews was the one true God. Therefore, she decided to identify herself with the God of Israel. She per risked her life to protect the spies. The spies were provided with a place of safety and hospitality. And I believe that Rahab's faith was genuine. It wasn't that she was just doing this for some other reason. She, she had genuine trust in God. She chooses to obey God and in doing so sets her course on a new trajectory into the future. Like Abraham, right? Like Abraham... Her faith was accompanied by action. She was not saved by what she did. Rather, it was salvation because she chose to believe God and this belief was then translated into her righteous actions. And her reward came after the fact. You know when God calls us to obey Him, we don't obey Him because He's the great cosmic Santa Claus in the sky and if we shake His, you know, 
we shake him a little bit this way or shake him a little bit that way. If it's not quite right, we try another angle and he'll give us eventually what we, what we want, right? That, that's not faith. Faith isn't manipulating the God of heaven. The God of heaven is sovereign over all of the earth. He's sovereign over our lives and he wants to give good things to his children. So when we ask for good things, he gives us good things all the time. He does it. And even in material things, if we don't have material things, He gives us the good things such as peace and joy in the midst of our struggles. God is good. See, Rahab, she was not saved by what she did, but she believed. And she was rewarded in the end. Her, her life was spared. Her family was spared. And guess what? If you look at the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, guess who's in it? Rahab the prostitute is directly in lineage of the Savior of the world. Isn't that incredible? This is a testimony that God looks beyond the, the, the brokenness of people, and He chooses people that are broken to accomplish His, His purposes. Am I good enough to earn my place in heaven? No. No. I deserve, I'm in, a, in my natural state, I'm, uh, I'm in deserving of God's wrath. All of us are. But God has mercy on us, and He uses us in His plans. So, the final point to cinch what James is trying to say about the nature of faith is that he goes on to explain that faith without good works accompanying it is as dead as a corpse without a living spirit in it. He says in verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead doesn't matter how many times you cross your chest or how many church services you go to or whatever you, you do religiously, you know, that's, it's not, that's not what saves you. And, and that's not true faith. True faith is surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and saying, God, take me. Take me and break me and see if there be any wicked way within me, and cleanse me from my sin, cleanse me from unrighteousness, and, and set me on the course that is glorifying to you, Lord. We sing that song, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. That's an old song in the church. You probably don't even recognize it, some of you younger people here. He lives, he lives, Jesus is alive in me. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. <laughs> See, when you, when you become a believer, Christ lives in you, and he lives through you. And if he's not living in you, and not living through you, then you're truly not a true believer. Your faith is not genuine. This is what James is saying. Unless there's a change in your life, then your faith is just window dressing. Religion that God sees as pure and faultless is not self-focused. Rather, it is God-centered, it is other-centered, filled with love and compassion and a desire to see God's kingdom established in people and to see God be given the glory when He sets these people free from their sins. Our faith. If our faith is only demonstrated by a verbal assent to truth, and it's not accompanied by active living for Christ, which means sacrificing our own wants for the wants and desires of others. We have a problem here. And we need to repent. God never writes anything in His Word without reason. He wants us to pay attention. Now, I'm not judging anyone here, okay? But you need to evaluate your heart where you're at, okay? You, only you know where your heart is. Is your heart truly surrendered to God? Or are you just religious as a window dressing? God wants your heart, and he wants to use you in his kingdom work. Not because he has to, but because he loves you and he wants you to participate with him in his wonderful work of redeeming people and setting people free. Mm. So, 
just as, because we believe in Jesus, just because we believe in Jesus does not mean we have saving faith this morning. The demons believe in Jesus, and they shudder. Faith that is not accompanied by repentance and submission to God and the pursuit of God's glory in daily living is not genuine. So, we're not saved by good works. We're saved by saving faith. And good works come as a result of it as the fruit of our salvation. Save, saving faith, conclusion today, today, does not look to self but looks to Jesus Christ. Saving faith agrees with God's word, both inwardly and with words from our mouth. Saving faith is grounded in what Jesus did out of love for us on the cross and by the empty tomb. Saving faith will naturally be expressed in both repentance from sin and in doing things that glorify God, good works. Those good works find their forms in many things. Everything that we do, everything that we are. Saving faith may sometimes doubt. Anyone here struggle with doubt sometimes? You're not alone. I think if we're all honest, we do, right? Saving faith may sometimes doubt, but those doubts are not bigger than the faith. Nor are they more permanent than the faith. This kind of faith says, the saving faith says, Lord, I believe in you. Help me, Lord, in my unbelief. One of God's disciples said in the scriptures, help me, Lord, in my unbelief. Is that the cry of your heart today? It's the cry of my heart. Saving faith wants others to come to the same saving faith that you've experienced. Because that's, the, that's glorifying to God and he loves that. Saving faith is more than just Lord, Lord. In Matthew 21 to 23, Jesus brings a sobering reality to people who think that their religious observances and their practices demonstrate true saving faith. In this passage, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and tell, and in your name perform many miracles. So he's bringing up the ones that have these spiritual experiences even, but not genuine faith. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Friends, we don't want to fool around. Christianity is not just something that you wear on the side as a side addition to your life. As fire insurance. It's not a fire insurance policy. Christianity was meant to be all-consuming, all-encompassing. Why? Because when you accept Jesus with saving faith, the Spirit of God makes His home in you, and He comes to be close to you, closer than the mention of His name. And the Spirit of God within you is a seal on you, guaranteeing eternal life to come. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful. So, ah, good works. Are they hanging off the branches of my life? Or am I all about me, myself, and I? Good works is service to God and service to others. It's taking the time like the Good Samaritan, to care for people that are in distress. It's taking the time to spend time to make sandwiches for someone who's grieving the loss of their loved one or giving to missions or, for that matter, to the mission of the church. Why? Because God's, God's kingdom has been established with his people. Know you not that you are all the body of Christ? If you're a member of his body, each of you is part of that. And this morning, if you're struggling with surrender, 
you need to let that go and ask God to give you a heart of trust in Him. And trust Him and, don't, and, and, and see how He will meet you when you trust Him. He will meet you right where you are, right where you need to be met. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for James. We thank you for this day. We pray, God, that as we go our separate ways this morning, Lord, that you would just speak to us. God, show us the things that we need to surrender to you and help us, God, to let go of the bottom and to let you take us. God, we praise you for this group of people that are here, and we just ask that you, your grace and peace would rest on each one in abundance today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.